Welcome to Unpacking Armenian Studies here at the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies. This is a limited series within Unpacking Armenian Studies that we're calling Ukraine, Armenia, and War. In the nine previous episodes, we've explored the situation on the ground in Ukraine and Poland by speaking with Armenia's ambassadors in Warsaw and Kiev, now in Lviv. Uh, we've discussed the everyday social and political realities in Armenia and Georgia as caused by the war, the view from Iran, the financial and economic impact on the Caucasus, Armenia specifically, concepts of sovereignty, regional political allegiances, and the role of the Ukrainian diaspora. And you can find all these episodes on the same platform that you've visited to listen to this episode, which we are calling The View from Turkey. Looking at the Ukraine war from an Armenia or Caucasus perspective necessarily means trying to understand the role of Turkey as mediator, as arms supplier, as political opportunist, as neighbor, as geographic transit point, and I'm sure I've left out some other aspects and my guest today will set me straight. I'm really pleased to be speaking with Amberin Zaman, a Turkish journalist who has for years reported on Turkey and the region. She was with The Economist as its Turkey journalist, representative, editor, and she's now senior correspondent for Al Monitor where she not only writes about Turkey, but again, the Middle East generally, especially Syria and Iraq. And she also co-hosts the Al Monitors on the Middle East podcast. Amberin, thank you for finding the time. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me, Salpi. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm looking to you um, to comment on the issues that I raised and to make sense of them and specifically to help us understand how Turkey has positioned itself vis-a-vis -vis both Ukraine and Russia. Well, it's pretty straightforward, at least uh, on the surface. Turkey has sort of positioned itself in the middle. So on the one hand, it's been you know, developing military ties in particular with Ukraine, but at the same time, lending tremendous diplomatic support to Ukraine. Uh, in 2014, when Russia invaded Crimea, or rather annexed it, and then also um, ignited this separatist movement in the Donbass, Turkey sided very openly with Ukraine and declared the annexation uh, as illegit illegitimate. Um, and so it's also been, as we all know, selling uh, combat drones to the Ukraine, combat drones that are now being used against Russia, and uh, quite effectively so. Yet at the same time, it's also maintained its rather complex, but nonetheless very deep relationship with uh, Russia. And how so? Well, first of all, uh, Erdogan has openly said, Turkish President Erdogan, that he will remain a friend of both countries. He's offered to mediate between the two countries. And in fact, the first ever meeting between Ukrainian Foreign Minister um, Kuleba and Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov since the start of the conflict on February 24th took place in Turkey's Antalya resort. Uh, Turkey has not joined in any sanctions against Russia, and it's kept its skies open to Russia, which is terribly important because now, as you know, uh, Russia can't use European airspace. And so Turkey has now become really a very critical sort of route for, for Russia to have access to the rest of the world, but also um, for its war effort in Syria. Turkey is an extremely important supply line for the Russian forces there. But again, what it has done is uh, invoked the Montreux Convention, which guarantees free uh, passage of all commercial vessels through the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits to say that now that we have a war, and it's called it a war after some hesitation, uh, naval vessels cannot 
go through the straits anymore. It said, though, that Russian uh, vessels that need to go back to port can do so uh, on a one-off, as for other Black Sea littoral countries that have naval, naval ships, uh, you know, outside the, the Black Sea and need to come home, they can come home, but that's it, finito. No American ships, no Western ships, no military ships anymore coming through those straits. And so it's, as I said, positions itself in the middle. And interestingly, interestingly, you see a large number, ever-growing number of Ukrainians now seeking refuge in Turkey. But at the same time, Russians who feel very deeply insecure now as a result of the sanctions that have been rained on Russia also showing up in Turkey. So uh, Turkey is in this really very unique position, but you know, more broadly, obviously, it's trying to sort of strike a balance between uh, Russia and NATO. The, let's talk just really quickly about the Russians and the Ukrainians on the ground, and then we'll go back to NATO. The, the interesting thing seems to be that both the pro-Kremlin Russians who are trying to hide from the, the pressure at the very least that is to come upon them and the non-pro uh, government Russians, the liberal younger, all of them are seeking refuge in Turkey. Well, that's and a great yet, point, Salfi. I'm glad you raised that because we have Roman uh, Abramovich uh, moored off the shores of uh, Bodrum. His two super yachts have parked themselves in Bodrum and Marmaris. And at the same time, as you say, uh, there are many sort of, we're hearing, this is anecdotal, I don't have proof, but we're hearing about Russian companies that have been sanctioned, sort of trying to now uh, refashion themselves as Turkish companies so they can continue doing business. At the same time, Russians apparently bringing lots of money into the country, though How? Turkish authorities say they, you know, they, they won't sort of accept any shady money. Uh, but so that's the that going on. Place? But at the same time, as you say, the pro-liberal uh, Russians showing up. In fact, there is this guy, Chubais, who supposedly has now surfaced in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah. Goodness. But but how is the money situation? I've spoken to filmmakers in Istanbul who have said that colleague filmmakers from Russia, you know, came in one day with active credit cards and the next day found themselves penniless. Yeah, but that's for the credit cards because, you know, R Russian banks have been cut out of the, you know, credit card SWIFT system. That's why. But um, you can be sure that I'm guessing lots of Russian businessmen have just come in with suitcases full of money. It's going not to be that hard. No, all sorts of refugees on huh? the east. In fact, I was working on a story today looking at the situation of, you know, how um, Turkey has become a haven for money laundering and uh, organized crime networks, as well as for terrorist financing, which is why in last year, the Financial Action Task Force, this uh, international body that uh, is, you know, anti-money laundering body put Turkey on its gray list. Even before these adventures. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, um, and the sales of arms were also prior to these adventures, um, at a time when Turkey's position within NATO uh, was being somewhat questioned because of Erdogan and Erdogan's policies. So, in a way, this situation now with Ukraine is helping to uh, uh, correct Turkey's stance no, within the Western alliance? I wouldn't go that Far, to be honest, Salpi. I mean, obviously, everyone was okay with Turkey selling drones to Ukraine. And um, obviously, Turkey's geostrategic significance has once again been highlighted uh, by this war, for sure. And clearly, the West would like to have Turkey on its side, uh, as would Russia. But let's not forget that there are some very huge problems between Turkey and the United States in particular, stemming from its relationship with Russia, 
namely the fact that Turkey re remains in position, possession of Russian-made S-400 missiles, which the United States says uh, is a threat to NATO security, which is why Turkey has been sanctioned. It's been excluded from the F-35 um, fighter jet program and uh, military sales to, the, to Turkey uh, have been limited now by the US Congress. And until such time, Turkey agrees to get rid of these things, the S-400s, those sanctions will remain in place. And just, you know, I guess it was either today or yesterday, Turkey's Ministry, Minister of Defense categorically rejected getting rid of the S-400s. And then we had Erdogan's chief of comms write an op-ed or a letter. No, it was an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal saying, you know, there was no question of Turkey making any kind of concessions and that it was up to the West to repair relations with Turkey. And, you know, uh, as a precondition to sort of uh, re reinstate Turkey in the F-35 program and uh, do away with the sanctions. So <laughs> I don't see how you get around that just because Turkey happens to be uh, in a very geostrategic place geographically. Well, Turkey is also in an interesting place diplomatically in that if the, not if, but when this US and Russia standoff takes hold and deepens as it inevitably will, however we get to an end of this uh, phase of the conflict. In places like Syria, uh, will Turkey then become another sort of mediator, middleman? Will it find new space for its uh, position as the standoff between Russia and the US deepens? Well, that's an excellent question because, you know, you can see how Syria becomes an arena for that kind of horse trading where uh, the Russians might, you know, offer carrots in the way of letting Turkey have another go at the Kurds or mm -hmm. the Americans may be uh, pulling out at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because as you know, it's a very contentious issue, the fact that the United States uh, is um, basically the main patron of a Kurdish group that has very close ties to a Kurdish militia that's been fighting Turkey for the past 38 years and is on the United States list of terrorist organizations. So you can sort of envisage that kind of, as I said, um, bargaining that might take place, though, I mean, Biden administration officials I speak to are adamant that US troops will remain in Syria and for as long as they need to be there to defeat ISIS and that there's no question of that becoming uh, any kind of bargaining chip in its relations with Turkey. But, you know, who knows what might happen further down the road. And also, of course, Syria is very critical. Why? Uh, because there's all these people in this northwestern province called Idlib, like, like millions of displaced people who potentially could flood into Turkey if Russia decided to open those floodgates by launching a massive uh, aerial campaign, as it's long been threatening to, in conjunction, obviously, with Bashar Assad's regime. Uh, against those people there in that province. in Turkey. Yeah, that gives, um, you know, Russia considerable leverage over Turkey. So, you know, you can see how Europe. Turkey would, would, in fact, not want to, would want to rather maintain the status quo in Syria. Uh, ultimately, however much it complains about the US presence there, in fact, the US presence gives it some maneuvering space with the Russians actually. You know, I, I want to, I mean, I want to state the obvious that as important as it is to understand these uh, quickly, slowly moving relationships amongst the two, three, four powers, and we're not even talking about Europe and, and the European Union yet, 
But at the end of the day, Turkey's status with them, each of them, and in the world impacts how aggressively, uh, how wisely it does or does not act in the Caucasus, which is something I want to get to, obviously. But I just want to make clear that that there is um, all of this does, in fact, impact the Caucasus pretty directly, not that indirectly at all. Before we get to that, can we talk about wheat? Oh, yeah. Well, of course, the price of wheat has gone through the roof. Uh, and Turkey, 50% of Turkey's wheat comes from? Yeah, I don't think it's going to have a problem getting wheat from Russia. I don't see why that would affect Turkey, to be honest. And I can also see how Russia would make accommodations with Turkey precisely to keep it sort of on an even keel, to keep those relations on an even keel. Because uh, in the present circumstances, I think that Russia um, is more of a supplicant to Turkey than the West is. Mm. Yeah, for understandable reasons. Russia does not have too many options. And no. the, uh, uh, heading west, in any case, heading east, it may have a few, but no, no, no. absolutely not. All right. So you don't see I mean, wheat prices, of course. I mean, somebody was saying this morning that, you know, lavash bread here in Glendale has, uh, you know, doubled in price. So, <laughs> well, you know. yeah. I mean, Turkey has a, a big problem with uh, inflation in general, stemming. Right you know, obviously higher energy prices will certainly have an impact on Turkey. But then again, will the Russians sell Turkey cheap oil? Maybe. Um, but, but Turkey's economic problems, you know, are, are long precede this crisis in the Ukraine. And I would say to some extent or probably a great extent or of, of its own making and of Erdogan's poor, you know, uh, decisions uh, you know, this whole business of keeping interest rates down and maybe, you know, actually he'd like to have zero interest rates because this, he believes, uh, would be in keeping with the Quran, ha has had a terrible effect on the Turkish economy. The lira has lost um, something like half of its value yeah. over the yeah. past year and Turkey's um, reserves are depleted because they've had to sort of spend that all to prop up the lira. lira. Um, one more question before we get to the Caucasus. You've lived in Ukraine. What is, is it, this is a very general question, <laughs> Ukrainian public opinion generally regarding Turkey? Oh, very positive, um, very positive, extremely positive. Um, first of all, of course, they're all aware of the diplomatic support that Turkey's given Ukraine uh, starting in, uh, 2014 with the annexation of Crimea. Turkish companies are very active in Ukraine. For example, the third largest mobile phone operator is a Turkish one, Lifecell. Uh, millions of Ukrainian tourists have been going back and forth to Turkey where they're very well received. And you had a large and vibrant Turkish uh, community inside Ukraine doing business. And, uh, you know, they've been watching the soaps, they've been watching Huram Sultan, you know, who is mm -hmm. a Ukrainian, Suleiman, uh, the Magnificent's favorite bride, is from Ukraine. Um, so Turkish soft power, I think, has been very effective in Ukraine. And uh, that, that, that this, is an, this is a relationship that dates back to Ottoman times. I mean, the Ottomans have been allied uh, with the Cossack leaders of Ukraine in wars against Poland, against Russia. So this is not a new relationship. And yes, of course, the Bayraktars have sort of <laughs> had a multiplier effect, the drones, the combat drones. They've even composed songs about the drones. <laughs> All right. Um, let's come to the Caucasus and uh, talk about talk about the talk about the border opening between Armenia and Turkey. And we should make clear when we say opening the border between Armenia and Turkey, we're really talking about Turkey opening the border with Armenia because uh, that's where the, the key lies. Um, with this new added prestige, with the consistent increasing violence that Azerbaijan uh, continues to inflict on the Armenians of Radapach. 
in this environment, what will Turkey be seeking? Well, I think we first of all need to ask ourselves why Turkey, you know, extended this olive branch to start with. And the consensus was that this happened obviously before April 24th last year, was that it was meant to sort of prevent the Biden administration, the president, the White House from using the term genocide in its annual uh, commemorative statement on the genocide. But then Biden did use the term genocide, yet Turkey continued with its uh, sort of positive signaling, right? And so it was widely assumed then that, well, the reason must be then that, you know, this is part of Turkey's broader effort to come out of the doghouse because, you know, uh, it's sort of lost a lot of friends through its very aggressive behavior in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Libya and um, Syria, and, you know, its ties with Israel really gone to the dogs and have obviously very poor relations with, with the United States and the Gulf countries. So it was seen as part of that sort of effort. But then, we heard the Turkish foreign minister say, say very clearly that this was being done in lockstep with Azerbaijan and that every step of the way they would make sure that a Azerbaijan was fully informed of all of their all of the uh, substance of the talks and and any kind of decision and pretty much I would say uh, giving Azerbaijan veto power of the, over the process. As and that's not with that. Yeah, exactly. That's what happened with the Zero Protocols in 2009, when Azerbaijan sort of said, okay, well, you know, if that's what you're doing, well, you know, it did sort of threaten to cancel its, its, its investments and all sorts of things, and of course, mobilize Turkish public opinion at the same time. And so Turkey, or rather Erdogan, you know, decided to shelve the process, turn his back on it. So I think Turkey is giving Azerbaijan the uh, carte blanche to do that again. Why really? do you think that is so now at this point? You said earlier uh, the relationship between Turkey and Russia, you know, who is the supplicant in that relationship? Who is the supplicant in this relationship? Well, or is it not that simple? I, well, first of all, it's not that simple, but I hear from a lot of my Armenian friends that, you know, they are very interested in doing this because they do not want to be so uh, wholly dependent on Russia and that this will, you know, the, the Armenian allow them is to balance the relationship with Russia, which may be over decades, perhaps at some point, especially if uh, Russia itself changes. But, you know, from a security standpoint, I really don't see how that's realistic when you have Russians, you know, uh, uh, hang on to that for the moment. But tell me between, along the Turkish border. Yeah. Tell me between Turkey and Azerbaijan, why at this time in these political historic relationships, Turkey has again given Azerbaijan veto power over the border opening process. It was perhaps understandable, explainable, if not understandable, in earlier years. Why now? Well, because I think that they, the relationship with Azerbaijan is of great economic and political significance for Turkey. And, you know, the rhetoric is, you know, what had Ilham Aliyev, the father said, uh, two, uh, you know, uh, states, one nation, and they just now, in fact, sign this uh, strategic cooperation agreement that reiterates all of that, you know, this notion that somehow the two countries are one, the two nations are one. Um, and let's not forget the sort of, well, if you're following any of these uh, reports from uh, these journalists, uh, investigative journalist collectives, you know, the Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, it's yeah. very clear that Sokar, uh, Azerbaijan's, you know, state energy company, uh, has all kinds of murky ties uh, with various Turkish uh, officials 
Um, and so when you're looking at that relationship with Azerbaijan, you cannot uh, hold that, you know, you cannot disregard those sort of the, that web of ties that also brings in uh, Russians as well, you know, Russian oligarchs, Gazprom, all of these actors. Uh, it's incredibly murky, as I said. Um, and, and, you know, many people stand to benefit personally from all of that. So uh, first of all, let's, you know, uh, make that point. Mm -hmm. But also, I think that um, for Turkey, uh, they, they see an opportunity uh, now that they've played this big role in helping Azerbaijan uh, rest back those territories. They see an opportunity to uh, use that relationship, that leverage with Azerbaijan, not to be magnanimous with Armenia, but for other, you know, uh, other in there are other interests. In fact, you saw a bit of a detente ha uh, happening between Israel and Turkey in that during that war because they were sort of sharing the same base in Ganja, you know, where they were both both training, helping, arming, I guess, uh, the, the Azerbaijanis. And so the border process will very directly continue to be a function of the other bilateral relationship, Armenia and oh, Azerbaijan. Oh, absolutely. And I can see why, you know, Armenia, I mean, sorry, Azerbaijan is not opposed to this process because it sees it as a vehicle exactly for advancing its own uh, you know position on Nagorno-Karabakh and that's where I think it might hit a wall of the whole thing because as you pointed out while we're having this conversation Azerbaijani violence against Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh continues apace violations of the ceasefire continue apace I think what the, the, the big unknown here really um, is Russia. How does Ukraine and Russia's setbacks in Ukraine, how does that play out in the Caucasus? And how does that play out in the Caucasus in all sorts of ways, in its relationship to Georgia, of course? Yes. Um, and yes. in its uh, role as the peacekeeper ostensibly. Right, in right. Harapa. And I think in a way there is the flip side and I don't hear much of this from Armenia, but I wonder if this is not also a wake up call that if Russia can treat its brethren in Ukraine this way, uh, why can Russia not treat its brethren a bit farther away? Uh, with this, with similar unexpected violence, aggression, et cetera? Well, I think what we need to, I think a better, I mean, I would put it like this. What we've seen is just how um, actually uh, unpredictable, in fact, Putin has proven to be and how he has acted as many people would, as many people see it, irrationally he, he he made a very bad decision so what's you know how 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 do we know that he won't make more bad decisions in the future i mean i would not draw parallels between armenia and ukraine because for him ukraine is russia's lebensraum you know you <laughs> we all know the famous letter and how you know basically ukraine is russia ukrainians are russia and there's no such thing as a ukrainian identity i think the relationship with armenia is quite different um so i wouldn't i wouldn't i don't see a it scenario be that where armenia okay. i mean russia is going to attack armenia not attack but not necessarily um Perhaps not attack, but not necessarily be the defender. Uh, well, we already many... saw that, Salpijan, didn't we? I mean, how long did Russia sit on its hands at the start of the Karabakh conflict? So for those who see Russia uh, as the protector, there are lessons here, both directly in the Armenian Oh, sure. Situation. With that, I completely agree. 
I completely agree. But having said all that, I mean, for oh, there's one thing we we didn't talk about is the Zangazor corridor. When you said, yes. you know, why is Turkey so, um, you know, keen to sort of keep Azerbaijan happy? And I said it served its other interests, its other uh, objectives, and one of course is access to Central Asia, and that. You know, the quickest way is obviously through Armenia, through that mm -hmm. corridor onto Azerbaijan and then, you know, the rest. So um, that's another reason. Um, but and of course, all the oil pipelines, gas pipelines, obviously very important. There is now this to be built uh, road and rail between Azerbaijan proper through Iran to Nakhichevan. So perhaps that will ease some of the pressure there on the Zonkism. One hopes, corridor. one hopes, and it would also, I think, allay uh, Iranian concerns about this whole um, project, you know, because uh, as Iran sees things, perhaps it's all about... <laughs> Where they're you know, isolating Iran. Yeah, yeah, and basically um, just rubbing out its borders with, with, with Azerbaijan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with Armenia, sorry, uh, uh -huh. but... But setting all of that aside, Sapi, I don't want to come across, you know, as 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 if I'm opposed to this opening. Quite the opposite. It's something we've all haven't we advocated for decades, and you know, regardless of Turkey's motive, motives, I think it's an it would be an excellent thing if those borders were reopened, and if diplomatic ties were established, but clearly not at any cost. Yes, not creating a whole new set of problems in trying to ostensibly resolve this one. Well, I want it to talk be about done without preconditions. Yes. And so if Turkey is sincere, this should have happened yesterday. Yes. Yes, without preconditions is, you know, what we've been saying for, for decades. Those who have understood the importance of this, not just economically, but politically, psychologically. Oh, and all sure. Of that. And as I keep saying, you know. Um, this whole exercise is being conduct conducted in such a dramatically different environment. Osman Kavala is in jail. Turkey helped uh, Azerbaijan military in a war um, against Armenia. And so, it, you know, the whole sort of uh, rules of the game have changed. The balance of power has been upended. And, and it comes at a time, as I said, with Osman in jail and um, Erdogan's uh, repression growing by the day and for us people all of us Turks who believe in you know a democratic future for Turkey one of the preconditions of that there is definitely preconditions for that and one of the big ones is um, coming to terms with the Armenian genocide and so you know that spirit well, it's not fair. It, 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 civil society should be part of this process. You know, as we move forward with this, you know, Erdogan should be talking to uh, to Garo Pailan, to, to, you know, um, Kavala shouldn't be in jail. Um, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I understand. We should say Garo Pailan is a member of the Turkish parliament from the, the Kurdish uh, right. First Party. Right. And uh, uh, Osman Kavala is the philanthropist, cultural civic activist who had done so much to uh, promote and highlight the integrate, integrated lives of Turkey's minorities, Armenians, of course, amongst them, and is now has now been in prison for four years almost. Um, yes, that's that, right. Um, two areas that we didn't cover, even though we are past the 30 minutes, I keep saying is our limit, but I think important. One, in this business of Turkey repositioning itself in the Caucasus, how important is it to get that foothold that it seemingly did not get with the ceasefire, a permanent sort of presence that the Russians seemed to be able to not give Turkey? Well, it has a bit of a foothold. I mean, I'm assuming some uh, Turkish officers remain in Ganja and, you know, some this observation center that they set up. There. But obviously that's a far cry from, you know, actually having troops alongside the Russians uh, in Karabakh. They don't. Um, and I think quite, I, I frankly think that uh, Turkey's um, enhanced sort of role and influence in the Caucasus is being overstated. Uh, I, I really think that Russia has come out 
better because it's got it tr its troops in Karabana. And continues to have the upper hand. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and Russia can also be a spoiler. Indeed. Um, last question, and I guess this is a statement as much as anything, is that it is a fascinating lesson to watch Turkey, uh, which is not you know, one of the world's great powers, not a small country by any means, but watch Turkey uh, instrumentalize its ge geographic, political, economic abilities to in fact not fall to this new uh, Western, I would say, demand of uh, countries, smaller countries making these binary decisions, you know, are you for us or are you against us? Are well, you for I mean, Russia or against mirrors, Russia? I think this mirrors modern Turkey's history. Um, remember how it sort of tried to remain neutral in the world wars. I mean, the first world war, it was a kind of dragged in by the by the Kaiser, but um, the Second World War did its best, you know, to stay out and only join the Allies after the fact. Um, and throughout the early days of the, the Cold War, again, um, certainly before join, joining NATO, it, it tried to keep a balance. And then when you had the war between Iran and Iraq, same thing. Um, this is not particularly uh, a new um, you know, diplomatic behavior for Turkey. So it's not like Erdogan is some kind of genius who's figured this out. I would, on the contrary, I, I would like to, if we're ending this um, show by reminding everybody that in the same way that uh, Vladimir Putin, this brings, you know, the, the, the considered to be the maestro of brinksmanship has come out with a lot of egg on his face. Well, it, I think we have the risk of Erdogan not taking the, 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 the um, requisite lessons from, uh, from this uh, war and maybe overplaying his hand again. Let's hope that uh, the Caucasus is not standing in its way. Well, because, oh. you know, this is what happens when you set up authoritarian regimes and you isolate yourself, you silence your critics, you m muzzle the press um, and surround yourself with sycophants. <laughs> you make bad decisions. Well, lots, lots to be afraid of, lots to watch, uh, lots to still try to understand. Uh, Amberin Zaman, thank you very much. For your time. Thank you, Salpi. It's always great to be with on your show. Thank you. And thank you all for following this limited series that we are calling Ukraine, Armenia, and War. We hope that it has lent a bit of understanding to really what is extremely not just complex, but also something that is going to be with us for a long time and impact lives, economies, uh, futures in many places in the world and not least in the Caucasus and in Armenia. You can follow this limited series on all of the podcast platforms and on the Institute of Armenian Studies website. This is the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies. The series is Unpacking Armenian Studies and I'm Salpi Razaya. You've been listening to Unpacking Armenian Studies, a podcast series on the Institute of Armenian Studies channel. This episode has been produced by Sadin Habeshian. Music by Josue Gonzalez. For more from the USC Institute of Armenian Studies, go to the Institute's YouTube channel to hear dozens of talks by scholars from all over the world. You can reach the Institute at armenian at usc.edu and follow the Institute on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This podcast has been recorded at the University of Southern California Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. Thank you.